give me a sense of what it was like for both of you the first time that you walked into Rideau Hall as Governor General, as Vice Regal Consort. What was the feeling for you when you came through the doors? How do you answer that? <laughs> well, I, I, we had been here before yes. for David's Order of Canada and then being promoted. Um, we were invited by uh, Madame Jean, Jean Daniel. They invited us, and so we had a nice evening. They took us through, and I thought I needed GPS. Um, but it's everyone's so friendly. You just are not in awe of the size of it because everyone is smiling and looking nice, and, and they're happy that you're there. So that really facilitates that first walkthrough till you find out where your bed is. So um, it, it was not so intimidating, I should think. I remember three things, I think, Catherine. One is how beautiful the grounds were. It's 80 acres, and it's a wonderful park. Uh, and it is the home of the people of Canada. And I guess I had a little sense of that, but that's become a much more profound sense to me. Um, the second was that um, we actually came in just after uh, I was sworn in on Parliament Hill on a calèche, and our grandchildren joined us at the gate and jumped into the horse-drawn carriage, and it was quite wonderful coming up that long driveway with the, the grandchildren. And uh, I guess as we stepped in, I thought, my, well, this is going to be our home for the next few years, and um, this will be fun. You do have a large family. You have five daughters. You have... Um, a number of grandchildren. Eleven. It, I, and, and, in, and it seems to, to keep counting. Yeah. I think the last time we had an interview, you were at six or seven. So um, it would have been important for you to know that you were going to live in a home where you could welcome your children and your grandchildren. Have you been able to do that here at Rideau Hall? Well, if I guess I, if I answer that, we had uh, all of the kids and I guess the day before we had had the Aga Khan, did we not? Mm -hmm. In any event, we had had sort of a diplomatic function at the long table. And all of the staff here, are so they are so agile that the next day it was all filled. You're right, we had less kids, but, but there were cousins all filled with high chairs and booster seats. So there had been something, you know, completely formal. And then they switched over 24 hours later, we have all the kids there. So right from the get-go, so that's within uh, 24 hours of David's installation that... They were, they were quite clear that they can do formal things, but they can swing around and get all the kids in. Did you make that clear to them initially that the family would be a, a visiting and be staying? And I think that's a fair question. It's unusual. I mean, other than the Schreiers, um, there haven't been you know families having so many people, so many young people. Um, we probably did, but we didn't have to make it clear in an unpleasant way. We just uh, the kids were just here, and they just went to bat, made right. it fun. Yeah. I remember that second night very vividly they because it was. Stunk, I know. <laughs> that's right. It was a wonderful contrast of the formal and the informal. We had a great dinner around the long table for the Aga Khan Foundation. Kofi Annan was here that evening, and other people who are a member of the board of of his Institute on Pluralism. And as they were going out and were bidding them farewell, I noticed that uh, the uh, doorman uh, was motioning to go in a slightly different direction than was normal. And I thought that's a bit unusual, but so be it. So I come back into our private quarters, and Sharon says, uh, I'm going to take the dog out for, for a walk. I said, I'll do it, dear. She says, all right, but put the leash on the dog. Leash, leash, who needs a dog? A leash on the dog. It's sitting in the garden. So out I go, just outside the door, into the garden, and our dog sees a pussy cat in the dark, which, of course, is a skunk, <laughs> and gets sprayed like you wouldn't believe. The reason our guests had gone in a different direction is because the doorman saw the skunk and said, don't go there. The skunk came into the garden. The dog confronted the skunk. And for the next hour and a half, I was in the shower in my bathing suit with tomato juice and, and one of the wonderful people that looks after domestic things scrubbing uh, tomato juice into this dog. In, in Monsieur Le Faux shower, we said, yeah, so all we, covered with, with red tomato juice. So we said, it looks like there's been an axe murder <laughs> in Monsieur Le Faux shower. So, so we got but, to know the, the great staff that look after it pretty, right. pr pretty quickly. <laughs> I think it's pretty remarkable for Canadians to know that uh, their governor general put on a bathing suit and scrubbed down the dog with tomato juice in the what shower. What choice did you have? Otherwise, it's smelling <laughs> that dog for the next 48 hours. With me, with me outside shouting directions. <laughs> and, and, I'm the okay. typical family. Yeah, and giving right. some helpful comments as to why you didn't put the dog on the leash. Of course. What are <laughs> the stories comments. you never will live down? You talked so about... So we knew we were home. <laughs> you talked about... Um, 
coming in here and um, feeling comfortable because all of the people were friendly. And that in and, in and of itself is an interesting comment because, of course, most of us don't have all sorts of people in our homes. Mm -hmm. Has that been an adjustment, that element of living with all sorts of people around you who are uh, working in this uh, residence, uh, which is also um, a place a place of work? What Sharon refers to that is living above the shop. That's right. <laughs> not, not an easy thing to do. But in terms of uh, the staff, the, the one thing they had to, I guess, appreciate is that we tend to just want to do our own thing and be independent. So having a lot of staff, I mean, we've always had a housekeeper, a nanny or whatever, but just having a lot of people around all the time and, and staff, but, you know, they could see that we didn't want that, so we tend to just, you know, mud around ourselves. Um, but we didn't have a lock on our door, so we asked, well, that, that was partly because of our dog that got into the skunk, but we asked people to just walk in. To please don't knock, because he didn't like knocking. Uh, just walk in. So everybody came and went in a very uh, normal sort of way. Do you mean they uh, would just walk into your residence? Yes, we learned to wear house coats. <laughs> Well, well, they usually showed us to come again. Yeah. Well, they would just, I mean, knock, and then they would just come in. So, the, the wonderful thing about the people who, quote, work, unquote, at Rideau Hall is it's a very large family, and they function like a family. And the, the people we work with uh, become members of our family in an extended sense. Our grandchildren love the people here. They refer to this as the big house. They love to play hide-and-seek because there are lots of rooms to get lost, and their parents can't find them and take them home. So we tell Members of the staff, if you see a child in the closet, just throw a sandwich in to keep them for a little bit longer. You can have a nap. Yeah. Yeah. And there, you've got your domestic side, so you've got the people, and the, those domestic people are looking after, a, a, you know, just two people, um, a couple, and then they swing into something that's 200 people. It's extraordinary to see the way go, they go back and mm -hmm. forth. So they're not here really looking after us. We tend to just do our own thing uh, with a little bit of help from them. But last night, what was it, 200 people and the, these functions, I think we said 22,000 people in a year um, that are coming through just for the functions. That's not tours or anything. I don't know whether so. your camera can pick this up, but the piano behind us is Glenn Gould's practice piano. So last night was the uh, Glenn Gould Award, the talent award to, uh, to Robert Lepage, uh, who's an extraordinary, uh, talented artist in a number of genres. A six-year-old boy, Ryan from Vancouver, was performing on that piano just to start the evening off. And then just a huge number of extraordinary artistic uh, presentations uh, through the evening. So right here in this room. And we, we call Rideau Hall the home of the people of Canada. And we have many events like that that celebrate excellence and many other events that celebrate, you know, Canadian people just helping their neighbor. You call this the home of um, Canada's people mm -hmm. and we are sitting in a room that is often used during formal occasions um, or events mm -hmm. at least and yet are you able to in your private moments if you have any private moments come here to read a book or go into the um, the sunroom and sit on a couch and read the newspaper are those things that you're able to do in the larger residence well where I go is uh I call it the Buchan Room. It's a library down the hall. And in that room are all the Governor General Literary Award books. There are actually uh, 14 different categories, seven English, seven French. And John Buchan, Lord Tweensburg, was Governor General from 1935 to 1940. And he established the Governor General Literary Prizes. Now, Buchan himself wrote 120 books. Uh, not a bad feat. And uh, writing was not his first occupation. He was a cabinet minister, minister of parliament, member of war cabinet in World War I, um, publisher, etc., governor general, and continued to publish all this time. So I love that room, uh, and if I want to sit for some quiet reading, that's where I'll go. Yeah. No, he doesn't. No, he has to hear from me, because we don't do that, and we need to do that. So yeah. you've asked a very good question. So he loves the room, and he loves to show people the room. I'm going to speak for you now, dear. And I love to read. No, no, he loves to read, but, but we're not taking advantage of the fact that we can use any of these rooms. And I had a very nice conversation with John Ralston Saul last night. He was sort of saying, you know, this is how you have to do it. So we tend to, at the end of the day, be so tired, and this becomes the shop. And so we stay up in our apartment, which is somewhat confining. So we have to correct that. 
In terms um, of making more use absolutely. of Absolutely. Come down here. It's beautiful. But no, in the summertime, we're outside all the time. Yeah. But, we, you know, we really need to sort of readjust. Um, if you're exhausted, come down. And there are some places that are that's small and uh, not so spacious that you feel kind of overwhelmed. But So that's where I'm, I'm just telling the truth. The fact is we have to modify um, living within the office and, and within, you know, the Though I would imagine you, you don't have a lot of time to no. actually enjoy the house itself outside of the formal events. I mean, you are on the road a lot, so when you are here, um, you probably do feel most comfortable and happiest to just stay where you can right. achieve a modicum of privacy. Can you achieve that privacy in your in your private apartment? Oh, absolutely. You I can. Mean, it, it's, uh, Despite the need to wear a bathrobe? Yeah, well, that's, well, you've got to, the aide de camps that are always there telling you you've got five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, you know, two minutes, and so on, to make sure you'll be in time. You have to give it give us to it in the second as well, four <laughs> minutes and 33 seconds. <laughs> so we, um, but we, we, you know, people just come and go. But the, that's the domestic side of the house. Um, the office people are not up there. And, and, you know, unless for some reason we want to meet up there, whatever, um, we just treat it very uh, normally. But we... And I think this is an important thing. We have our country house up at uh, Tremblant, which is absolutely fabulous. And we've been there since 1979. So we can go on weekends. We love skiing. We love kayaking, whatever it is. So we've been able to escape because we can drive there. It's right. not a long distance. So that, in a sense, that's where we cozy up. Do you feel that you're living in a house that's a piece of living history? Do you feel when you walk down the, the, the hall that it's, you know, that there is a history to sure. the home that goes beyond... Um, uh, your presence here, or even the presence of your most recent predecessors, that there's something to the house. Quite so. And I think one sees the chapters of history through the lens of this house with the different periods, etc. In my office uh, are inscribed the names of um, all of the Governor Generals since Lord Monk in 1867. And uh, it's really quite intriguing to look at those names and to think of that period in Canadian history and the changes that have occurred, the circumstances, and uh, how we've evolved as a nation. So, uh, yes, there's a lot of history here, and that's one of the reasons we're so keen that it be perceived as the home of the people of Canada, to come and relive our history, and uh, especially see the things about which we should be most proud. Now, Your Excellency, you've talked about how there are um, the, the names of your predecessors are inscribed on the walls is it true that you also have pictures drawn by your grandchildren yes. stuck to the walls as yes. well? Yes. So you As, can make it your own space. Yeah, we call that the modern art. <laughs> no, he loves his office. The most That's valuable for sure. art. He likes his office. That's, uh, you know, in, in terms of you know resting and relaxing and sitting there. And uh, so many interesting people would have been in there. Absolutely. And that must be neat to think about. That. Yeah, and through through this place, and we we see a lot of interesting people. We yeah. receive the. Uh, new ambassadors who present their letters of credential here. One has to present, withdraw the previous letters of credential and present the letters of credential of the new ambassador before officially they function. So we have a ceremony at least once a month where we receive anywhere from two to seven or eight new ambassadors. We have about 200 in all. They're more than countries because some associations like the European Union have ambassadors. And um, their tenure is typically three to four years. And it's a wonderful educational opportunity because one has to learn uh, about the country more than a right. quick snapshot in some of the intricate issues. And then one has a chance to discuss those issues with that person right there. And then we have heads of state who visit here. Uh, so it's a terrific venue for having a great uh, understanding of comparative politics, uh, comparative economics, and different cultures. Yeah. I I'm a a university person, and I feel I should be paying a tuition for all I learn every day. <laughs> do you, um, getting to the nitty-gritty details, do you, have you had to cook while you're here? Are these, do you have people who cook for you, or do you have a kitchen of your own? How does that work? We have a, there is a kitchen, yeah, and it's a small uh, kitchen, and um, we make our breakfast, and we sometimes want things just in the freezer, and we'll put them in the oven or whatever, but it's it's easier to just have things done because it's sort of part of the living room and so on. Yeah. But food is not an issue. We're very well looked after, and you know we're just it sounds totally ideal to me. We're just kind of very simple in our tastes. My uh, I have five sons-in-law, three of them are really great cooks, and I tell them I'm going to throw them out of the husband's union. Oh, <laughs> absolutely! It's the boys that cook, isn't it? That's right. They're good. That's right. I'm not. <laughs> 
Well, you don't want to do that anyway. Do you have an office here as well? I do. I have a wonderful little office. Yeah. What is it, Lady Louise? I guess it's just right there. And there was a huge office for the spouse. And I looked at this and thought I could never put it to good use. So I asked NCC if we could convert that and the table in there, big round table we put in. It's a conference room and it's used from morning to night. The other thing about that yeah. converted office of Sharon's as a conference room is we've made it a Aboriginal First Nations art yeah, room so with, with oh. various. We have a policy it. of no gifts, and alas, sometimes there are exceptions, and our First Nations people are particularly generous in wanting to provide gifts, so we take those that are appropriate for that room and we put them on display there, so it's a wonderful part of the of the house and a wonderful part of Canada. And Sharon's little office, then, is a, just a, we love a it. Everybody beautiful loves little coming place. To visit in there. It's, it's a tiny little place, and you yeah. sit in the arm of the chair and watch your work. It's well, right you know, there. and I, I think that that's the interesting thing, too, is that probably because it is small, yeah. Uh, in a large residence, there's yes. a feeling of intimacy yes. to it that mm -hmm. would make it um, a really wonderful place to be, a kind of calm and and um, and pleasant place she to be. She wrote a book there. Her, her novel is. Uh, well, I did just write it there, but anyway, I do do some correction. Don't we love the way we speak for each other? <laughs> that's, you know, that's one aspect of being married almost 50 years that we tend to finish one another's sentences. But it's, two uh, minds are better than one, dear. That's right. <laughs> That's a good, that's, uh, my husband always says I chose a long time ago whether I was going to be right or whether I was going to be happy, and I chose happy. <laughs> so, um, tell me about uh, visitors. You've talked about some of the events that you host here, and um, some of the former governors general stay here. You also sometimes welcome um, visitors to the country who are high profile um, uh, and making official visits. Are you able to welcome friends? Can you have friends come to stay the weekend with you? Sure, all three. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, uh, we do host uh, visitors who are here at state visits, and that's really very enjoyable because you get to know these people beyond a formal session. Uh, you, you chat with them, etc., and that's been terrific for us and good for the country that they are treated as guests in a home as opposed to kind of official things. Uh, number two, um, we, uh, we do have friends uh, who come here very often uh, with our, our families here and friends are here, so it's uh, open uh, in uh, that respect. And, and thirdly, um, when I say this is the home of the people of Canada, we have I think about 125,000 people go through the house each year here at another 20,000 or so at La Citadel, which is our second official residence in Quebec City. And so that's a good thing. And then many, many more people come and use the grounds, the 80 wonderful acres that are open uh, all the time year-round for during daylight hours. And it's great to see this is a place for picnics. Yeah. Have you had um, a most memorable guest who has stayed here, uh, other than your personal friends? Has there been many. one? Well, you've had many. Many, there are many memorable ones, but one that I can recount because it's so much fun is uh, shortly after their marriage, uh, Prince William and Princess Kate were here, and we have now 11 grandchildren, six-year-old twins, Kate and Nick, and Kate is christened Kate, and so she met Princess Kate, and she was able to say then at age five, uh, it's a great honor to meet you, Princess Kate, and Princess Kate said to her, it's a great honor to meet you, Princess Kate. Oh. Alaskan. So our little five-year-old, now six-year-old, remember that for the rest of her life. Will she ever? Yeah. That's so wonderful. Yeah, we thought so. Yeah. It makes it richer, Catherine, too, when there is a ceremony, performing arts or Order of Canada, and you look at the list and you see who might be able to bring their family or whatever, and, and they stay here. And it really makes a richer experience, not just being to the ceremony itself, but actually staying in this, as David is saying, really historical house. So um, we keep it fairly full. And and we have fun with all of that. I, I wanted to you raise the question of previous governors general. Uh, that's very important to us. Last yeah. night, for example, with the Glenn Gould Award, we had uh, our immediate predecessors, Madame Jean and Monsieur Lafont, uh, Madame Clarkson and uh, Monsieur Saul. Uh, we have had uh, Mr. and Mrs. Schreier uh, here uh, with the uh, on a fairly regular basis. And last evening, uh, Dana Fowler LeBlanc, uh, Romeo LeBlanc's, what it was here, uh, stayed overnight. And that for us is a great connection with uh, this place as, uh, as an institution where it has a living history 
and those individuals are very much part of it. Gerda Natishan, uh, the mm -hmm. widow of Ray Natishan, uh, is a frequent visitor here. Gerda was here within the last week. They contribute so much. They have such great memories and mm -hmm. that continues to, to live on. So that's an important feature of life at Rideau Hall that it's not so much the place of the couple that happened to be the occupants, but it's a tradition of people who've served Canada in this office, each of whom have brought their particular personalities, their characters, their emphases to it, and, and left those as permanent marks in the place, and we hope strengthen the country as a consequence. I think one of the other important elements is that these homes, uh, while being official residences, are still the homes of a family mm -hmm. or a couple uh, or the extended family of the, the governor general and his or her spouse. And um, I think it's sometimes we, we see them only as a residence and we forget the fact that um, they are the scene of birthday parties. They are the, mm -hmm. the site of a Christmas celebration. They are still uh, a person's place to live. And they are therefore inspired with those memories and traditions, even though it is for a, a you know a finite amount of time. Well, that's very important to us because uh, family is a pretty important part of who we are. We're lucky to have five marvelous daughters and now eleven grandchildren. And when I was installed in this position, the title of my installation address was a smart and caring nation. A call to service. Smart and caring. Both adjectives are important with three pillars, family and children, secondly, learning and innovation, thirdly, philanthropy and volunteerism. And, you know, the family in place is such a key feature of Canadian life. Uh, it begins there, the extended family, the place where you are establishes a sense of who you are and therefore what you can do. And so I, I think we have a great sense of our own family and a great sense of family life here in Rideau Home. Let's talk about the grounds because it's been the grounds have been mentioned a few times. Um, it, what is remarkable is that this is a beautiful um, residence on these remarkable grounds here in the heart of a city. Mm. Uh, or do you use the grounds? Do you all, all the day. we don't involve ourselves with the gardening, but we really appreciate it, and the kids love it. I mean, we play games and sports. He learned how to kick a football properly out there, being properly coached. We were all peeking out the window to sort of see how he was doing. I learned um, how to unkick it properly. <laughs> yeah. They asked me to kick off one of the Grey Cup games. I mean, literally just out there, we'd all be sort of looking to sort of see how he was doing. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. A little That's understanding how vain I am, particularly oh, when it comes to athletic things. That's right. So one of the staff people here is a great soccer player, so he got me out in the garden here, and he was trying to help teach me to kick sidewinder style where you address the ball from the side and actually use the side of your foot, not the toe. And I did it the first day, practicing two months before the great kickoff. And I, I kicked it about 80 times and my leg got so sore, I couldn't continue and I couldn't walk downstairs for the next week. So I said uh, to, to my friend, the coach, as I called him, that's it. I'm going back to the traditional style where you kick with your toe and you dress the ball straight on. He says, well, don't wear loafers. <laughs> so I got a kicking boot, boot and everything was fine then. But uh, being vain, I practiced for a few weeks. Well, then he broke I would an too. RCMP officer's finger. Oh, how? Practicing, that's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> don't say that. I don't think that's been uh, the, the, uh, an injury on the work report yet. <laughs> okay, we won't oh, say yeah. a word. That's right. Zip, zip. That's just, right. Just a tribute to the RCMP that look after us. These are remarkable and terrific oh, people. Yeah. Catherine? Anything else? I was hoping there was just a, a couple of questions staying on the history part, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Can we talk more about, you, you, you've spoken about it, but just elaborate more, about when you're working in your office? Because I'm always fascinated. Here, here the office is, as you said, there's been these great historical figures there. This is where Mackenzie King went and begged Lord Byng to probe Parliament. These key, mm -hmm. this is where Winston Churchill you know, has come and sat. Yeah. This is where Nelson Mandela, it's like, it's, it's the sense of history. Are you, when you work in your office, do you feel the set that the, you know, it's a global history sure. too? Sure, sure. Do you question? need me to ask that or are you taking no, my no, asks anyways? Just, no, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go you can just, um, we're not taking my asks anyways. Yeah. Well, I guess the question has to do with the sense I had of walking into my office for the first time and continuing to walk in and the history of the place. Well, I, I love history. I, I read history a lot. I read it. 
I think because I think it helps you prepare for the present and for the future. And I'm a lawyer, a law professor, but I have not done a lot of constitutional law in my lifetime. And so that's one of the first things I had to learn was the constitutional law of the position and um, went to work to do that with, with help. And therefore was conscious of the periods in the history of this office where constitutional law issues have arisen. And that was uh, just a very interesting journey to get back into the law books and to re-equip myself to understand that history so I could do the job more effectively. And I found that that's perhaps one of the characteristics that uh, remains with me, that it's been a, a wonderful learning experience. And I don't think you prepare for this job because uh, it's a kind of unusual job, but you, uh, you learn a lot on the way through and you're very dependent on people around you. Uh, who have various kinds of expertise that you put together and certainly drawing from the history is an important thing. For example, I guess I probably read now a couple dozen biographies of previous governors general or people in related positions and uh, I find I learn something from everyone. That's uh, a great form of personal development and with any luck you actually use it um, in your day-to-day -day work. Do you have a favorite room in the house, Mrs. Johnson? Other than my office. <laughs> and your bedroom. Well, uh, yes, my bedroom. Um, I guess like the tent room I like because that's where when we have had, you know, all the kids or Christmas or whatever, we set up our ping pong table and, you know, they can really run and do things. And then, you know, there isn't really a favorite room. Then the uh, formal, um, uh, not the drawing room, but the... Um, not the dining room, what are we... But I'm thinking of this room. Yeah, the... Um the ballroom, the ballroom, the ballroom exactly, yeah. the ballroom, thinking of dancing and stuff. So the ballroom, you know, they have uh, rolled up the carpet and the kids are all sliding yeah. and stuff. So, you know, we use the whole, when the kids are here and the family's here, we really use the entire house. They go up to the command post and then somebody hides as long as they don't go in a washroom. And then, you know, we try to find them, see where they are. So it, it's all, as a, as a whole entire big house, it's mm -hmm. all very attractive. So I don't, if we don't cozy up, and that's something we should do, we really take, you know, take advantage of the space and, and the kids stay here and all the sisters are together. So that's, that's really been a blessing. That's been very nice. I'd say probably three or four at least, uh, Catherine, depending on the circumstances. One place I love is the, the rink. It's, we believe, the oldest skating rink in North America. And for me, that's wonderfully attractive to go and skate in that rink and then go and skate in the Rideau Canal where you skate without bounds. That's so Canadian, and I'm like a kid uh, on that. Uh, a second uh, room that uh, that I really like is the ballroom as well, where we have the formal investitures for Order of Canada, whose motto, motto is they, they desire a better country. Uh, one vision of this office is to connect, honor, and inspire Canadians, and we're inspired by these Canadians who are inducted in our highest civilian office. We have our Order of Military Merit that's conferred there, Order of Bravery, Courage, etc., volunteers, and you see such um, exciting parts of Canadian life through the people that are recognized there. And I love the tent room, which is a very unusual place. It's a permanent room, but it's geared up like a tent. And one of my favorite comic episodes there was the Rick Mercer show. For the longest time, I resisted going on the Rick Mercer show. I said, that's the last thing on earth I would do to go and play jokes with Rick and look like a bumbling idiot. But finally, in a moment of weakness, I agreed, and we were supposed to do a skit on the rink, and it was a warm day. We couldn't use the rink. So in the tent room, we go, and Rick puts down a puck, gives me a stick. He has a stick. He says, let's go. I said, Rick, we can't play here. This is a marble floor. The puck will mark the floor. He picks up the puck. It's sponge rubber. So then he gets in front of a beautiful chest of drawers just beneath the painting of Queen Victoria, which is more than life-size. And he says, I'm a goaltender, take your best shot. I said, Rick, I can't take my best shot. I might hit Queen Victoria. He says, well, don't lift the puck then. So I'm already to take my shot. Rick is there, and I look on the chest of drawers. Normally there's a beautiful silver vase, and instead there's a glass vase there. I said, Rick, we can't play here. You might knock the vase over. He said, no, 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 no. He said, well, I'll be careful. I said, Rick, you might knock the vase over. He goes over, he picks up the vase, he brings it to me, turns it upside down, 99 cents <laughs> price tag. I said, what's the deal? He says, if I tell you the deal, will you go ahead with the skit? I said, over my dead body. But we went ahead with the skit. I take a shot. Rick does some maneuver. 
uses his stick to knock the vase off the chest of drawers onto the floor, smash the smithereens, and we go out running, running out the other door like a couple of school kids. Now you raise your children, you break a window. I'm sorry, sir, I've broken your window. I'll shovel your walk all winter long. And here's the Governor General with Rick Mercer running out the door. But people expect that with Rick Mercer. Do they? <laughs> Maybe they not of the Governor me? General, though. <laughs> <laughs> the things um, you will do, huh? Oh, for the office. For the office. Should we do the walk and talk, or is there let's another do, question? No, let's do the walk and talk. I just want one final question, staying with the history. Do you, do you, what, what do you think life was like for the earlier government generals um, that were here and their family? I've been reading a lot about the history, and in some sense, they felt quite relieved. They were away from the rigid Victorian society, and, and, and it was almost, they felt like they could relax here. Do you, have you done any reading in a sense mm -hmm. of what the early, the, the Dufferins and the monks? The article that you just read. Yeah, upstairs, downstairs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I have for the women, you know, the, mm. the, the huge different yes. uh, social approach, absolutely. You know, starting up uh, the, uh, was it Lady Dufferin that started up <coughs> yes, the May Court? The, and, and the, who, and the, the Haddo Club? Who did the Haddo Club? Yeah. Was that Lady Dufferin who did no, the? No, that was Lady Aberdeen. Lady Aberdeen, Aberdeen exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. a wonderful story. Yeah. So yes, from both sides. That would be great um, from your perspective of previous and, and also from yes, yours as well. Go ahead. Well, you're asking us about uh, previous people who've occupied this office. And first of all, it's, it's the Governor General and spouse. It's very much uh, an effort of two uh, plus their family. I think what I would say is it's changed a good deal, you know, as Canada has changed until 1867 to 1952, we always had uh, British Governor Generals. And then Vincent Massey was the first Canadian Governor General in 1952. I think that was a change in style and custom here. Uh, and I think from that period on, it's changed somewhat as Canada's become a different kind of society, uh, a much more pluralistic society, uh, one where, first of all, television has come into our life and now social media, et cetera, more open. Um, so that um, each uh, period, I think, has been somewhat different and each couple has brought a somewhat different influence on the activities here and what goes on. So I looked at, uh, went back in time, looking at uh, the spouses to sort of see how they would approach this role and how the family would. And uh, th this was the social hub. But what was that? If it was the, the house of the people, they were rather special people probably. It was a social hub probably for um, people of means. And they would sort of set a tone because they were leaders in the community. So I went back and sort of looked at that. But the women were really doing significant things. If you look at the VON or... Uh, um, the May nurses. Court and so on, that to the Victoria Order of Nurses, that um, they, these women were doing social innovation of a significant sort. They weren't working, but they were really in this sort of partnership, which mm -hmm. David and I have often talked about. You know, it really is a partnership. Um, and then you get into, uh, first of all, female governor generals, so now they're actually governor generals and they're, they're not spouses. And... Uh, in this sort of more modern approach, it's becoming more of the people's house. The, the, the people who are here, it's much broader. So you have a lot of your immigrant population coming here, um, feeling, you know, for the first time that, that this is the people's house and they're part of our country. So this evolution, they were doing good things that at, at the time that these were more old-fashioned family relationships. And then we got into sort of more independence and... and uh, people coming in and living their independent lives, still in a partnership, and uh, broadening, the, the I, I guess, the use of this house, not just as a small social centre, and setting the tone, um, like the May Ball or whatever mm. it was, things like that. So, Have you felt constrained by history and how you can use the house? I don't think so, not at all. I think what we have brought is... Um, a, a warmth and a, a kind of uh, informality that makes people, you mentioned uh, the baby, when we had uh, Sarah Polly's baby and we had our one-year-old baby upstairs, a grandchild, um, we have brought this warmth in. So when people come in and they're somewhat in awe of being in this uh, historical house and this very grand house, they they very quickly relax. If, if That's a nice thing, I think, that we've done. I, I'm happy that we've made people feel it really is their house, which makes it harder to find spots where you can hole up, so to speak, because you're really wanting tourists to come and people to be around. So, 
But uh, no, there, there's no constraints. The, the modern approach I want to bring is, or less modern or whatever, I, I could have been a professional fully working. 